The appendicular muscles control the movements of the upper and lower limbs and stabilize and control the movements of the pectoral and pelvic girdles. So just like with the axial muscles, you will be required to know the name, location, action, origin, and insertion of the appendicular muscles that are outlined in this talk. For the movement of the scapula, the, um, the muscles help by stabilizing the scapula, but also work with the humerus, and they help to increase the arm's angle of movement. And so some of the movements that are allowed then are elevation and depression, as well as protraction and retraction. The pectoralis minor is on the anterior side of the body, and it is a thin, flat, triangular muscle that is deep to the pectoralis major. This muscle helps to depress and protect the scapula, and so this is done by pulling the scapula anteriorly. And so when you have your shoulders hunched forward, the pectoralis minor is contracting. And so the origin of the pectoralis minor are ribs three through five, and it inserts on the coracoid process of the scapula. The serratus anterior is also on the anterior side of the body, and it is a large, flat, fan-shaped muscle that has a saw-tooth appearance that is positioned between the ribs and the scapula. This is a muscle that is a prime mover in the scapula for protraction, and so it is an agonist and works with the pectoralis minor. It's also a primary muscle to help stabilize the scapula against the posterior side of the rib cage, and it has a powerful superior rotator of the scapula by moving the glenoidal cavity in a superior fashion, which occurs when you abduct your upper limbs. The origins of these stem from ribs 1 through 8 or on rib 9, and they insert on the costal surface of the scapula. The levator scapulae is also on the posterior side of the body, and it is a narrow, elongated muscle that is deep to both the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles. It originates on the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae from C1 to C4, and it inserts on the superior angle of the medial border of the scapulae, or scapula. The primary action of the levator scapulae is to elevate the scapula, but it's also involved in inferior rotation of the scapula so that the glenoid cavity faces inferiorly. The trapezius is found on the posterior side of the body, and it is a large, flat, diamond-shaped muscle that extends from the skull and vertebral column to the pectoral girdle laterally. The trapezius can elevate, depress, retract, and rotate the scapula depending on which fibers are being activated and are actively contracting. The superior fibers of the trapezius can elevate and superiorly rotate the scapula. The middle fibers work with the rhomboid muscles and can retract the scapula whereas the inferior fibers of the trapezius are able to depress the scapula. And so the origin for the trapezius is the superior nuchal lines and the occipital protuberance of the occipital bone, as well as the spinous process of vertebrae cervical number 7 through thoracic number 12. And it inserts on the clavicle and the acromion and spine of the scapula. The phrase moving the glenohumeral joint and the phrase moving the arm or humerus means the same thing. And so for both, a movement such as flexion of the arm requires movement at the glenohumeral joint. The latissimus dorsi are muscles that are found on the posterior side of the body, and these are broad triangular muscles that are located on the inferior part of the back. They're often referred to as the swimmer's muscle because many of the actions are required for certain swimming strokes. The, it is the prime 
arm extensor and also adducts and medially rotates the arm. It originates on the vertebral spines of the seven thoracic vertebrae through the sacrum as well as the iliac crest and then it inserts on the intertubular groove of the humerus. The pectoralis major is on the anterior side of the body and it is also a superficial muscle. It is a large, thick, fan-shaped muscle that covers the superior part of the thorax and it is a principal flexor of the arm and also adducts and medially rotates the arm. And it is a synergist of the latissimus dorsi in terms of arm adduction. The pectoralis major originates on the clavicle and manubrium and body of the sternum and the costal cartilage of ribs 2 through 6 and it inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The deltoid is a thick and powerful muscle that functions as a, the prime abductor of the arm and forms the rounded contour of the shoulder. There are three different points for where the deltoid originates and based on these different fiber groups, they have different functions, such as flexion and medial rotation of the arm, abduction of the arm, and extension and lateral rotation of the arm. It originates on the acromial end of the clavicle, as well as the spine and acromion of the scapula, and it inserts on the deltoid tuberosity of the humerus. The corticobrachialis is a deep muscle that works as a synergist to the pectoralis major in flexing and adducting the arm. It originates on the coracoid process of the scapula and it inserts on the shaft of the humerus. The teres major is on the posterior side of the body and it is also a deep muscle. It works synergistically with the latissimus dorsi by extending, adducting, and medially rotating the arm. It originates on the dorsal surface of the scapula and it inserts on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. There are four rotator cuff muscles that provide strength and stability to the glenohumeral joint. These muscles attach to the scapula of the humerus and include the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the subscapularis, and the teres minor. The supraspinatus is on the posterior side of the body and it is for fully abducting the arm. It originates on the posterior surface above the spine of the scapula and it inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The infraspinatus is also on the posterior side of the body and it originates on the posterior surface below the spine of the scapula and it inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus. This, the action of this muscle is for lateral rotation of the arm. The subscapularis is on the anterior side of the body and it is the only one of the four rotator cuff muscles that is on the anterior side of the body. It is or, um, involved in medial rotation of the arm and it originates on the anterior side of the scapula and it inserts on the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The teres minor is on the posterior side of the body and it is responsible for lateral rotation of the arm as well as adduction of the arm. It originates on the posterior side of the scapula and it inserts on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The muscles in the limbs are organized into compartments that are surrounded by deep fascia. Each compartment houses functionally related skeletal muscles. The anterior compartment primarily contains elbow flexors and is considered the flexor compartment and the posterior compartment contains elbow extensors and is considered the extensor compartment. The biceps brachii is a large two-headed muscle on the anterior surface of the humerus. The biceps brachii flexes the forearm and is a powerful supinator of the forearm when the elbow is flexed. The tendon of the long head of the biceps brachii crosses the shoulder joint and so this muscle helps flex the humerus as well. The biceps brachii originate on the scapula and they insert on the radial tuberosity. The brachialis is deep 
to the biceps brachii and lies on the anterior surface of the humerus. It is the most powerful flexor of the forearm at the elbow. The brachialis originates on the anterior surface of the lower humerus and it inserts on the proximal end of the ulna. The brachioradialis is a prominent muscle on the lateral surface of the forearm. It is a synergistic in forearm flexion and effective primarily when the prime movers of forearm flexion have already partially flexed the elbow. It originates on the upper humerus and it inserts on the styloid, styloid process of the radius. The triceps brachii are found on the posterior compartment of the arm and it is a large three-headed muscle of the posterior surface of the arm. It is the prime extensor of the forearm and its actions are antagonistic to the biceps brachii. Only the long head of the triceps brachii crosses the glenohumeral joint where it helps extend the humerus. It originates on the scapula and humerus and inserts on the lecanon process of the ulna. The muscles that move the wrist, hand, and fingers all originate on the forearm, not the wrist or hand. That is why when you look at your own forearm, you have a larger mass of muscle that is located near the elbow compared to the wrist because a lot of the muscle bellies lie closer to the elbow. There is also an anterior compartment and a posterior compartment, and in general, the flexors are found in the anterior compartment and the extensors are found in the posterior compartment. Within the anterior compartment, we find a lot of wrist flexors and these include the flexor carpi radialis, the palmaris longus, the flexor carpi ulnaris, the flexor digitorum superficialis, and the flexor pollicis longus. The flexor carpi radialis is on the superficial layer of the anterior forearm muscles, and this extends diagonally across the anterior surface of the forearm. The tendon is prominent on the lateral side of the forearm, and this muscle flexes the wrist and abducts the hand at the wrist. The flexor carpi radialis originates on the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and it inserts on the second and third metacarpals. The palmaris longus is also on the superficial, superficial layer of the anterior forearm muscle, and it is absent in about 10% of individuals. This is a narrow muscle that is on the anterior surface that weakly assists in wrist flexion. The origin of the palmaris longus is the medial epicondyle of the humerus, and it inserts on the palmar aponeuroses. The flexor carpi ulnaris is also a, a superficial layer of the anterior forearm muscle, and this is found on the anterior and medial side of the forearm. It is positioned to both flex the wrist and adduct the hand at the wrist. The flexor carpi ulnaris originates on the olecranon process of the ulna, and it inserts on the pisiform and hamate of the carpals and on metacarpal number five. The flexor digitorum superficialis is the only muscle that is found in the intermediate layer, and this muscle splits into four tendons that each insert on the middle phalanges of fingers two through five. And thus, it is responsible for moving the metaphalangeal joint as well as the proximal interphalangeal joint of fingers two through five. And so it causes flexion of all these joints. However, it does not move the distal interphalangeal joint. And so this muscle originates on the shaft of the radius and it inserts on the shaft of the phalanges of numbers two through five. The flexor pollicis longus is a muscle that is found in the deep layer of the forearm anterior compartment. 
This muscle attaches to the distal phalanx of the thumb and flexes the metaphalangeal and intermediate phalangeal muscles of the, or joints of the thumb. In addition, because the muscle crosses the wrist joint, it can weakly flex the wrist. And so it originates on the anterior surface of the radius and inserts on the distal phalanx of the pollux or the thumb. The wrist extensors are found in the posterior compartment of the forearm muscles, where the extensor carpi radialis longus, the extensor carpi radialis brevis, the extensor digitorum, and the extensor carpi ulnaris are found within the superficial layer of the compartmental muscles of the posterior, and the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis comprise the deep layer of the posterior compartment. Within the superficial layer of the posterior compartment of the forearm muscles, start with the most lateral of the muscles, and that is the extensor carpi radialis longus. <clears throat> and this is a long tapered muscle that is medial to the brachial radialis, and it extends the wrist and abducts the hand at the wrist. It originates on the lower shaft of the radius and it inserts on metacarpal number two. Now more medial is the extensor carpi radialis brevis. And this muscle works synergistically with the extensor carpi radialis longus. This muscle will be shorter than the extensor carpi radialis longus. And so it originates also on the, on the lateral shaft of the radius, and it inserts on metacarpal number three. As we continue to move more medially in the superficial layer of the posterior compartment of the forearm, we have the extensor digitorum, and this muscle splits into four tendons that insert on the distal phalanges of fingers two through five. And so it helps to extend the wrist, the metaphalangeal joints, as well as the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints of fingers two through five. This muscle originates on the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and it inserts on digits two through five. The extensor carpi ulnaris is on the medial surface of the posterior compartment of the forearm and it inserts on the fifth metacarpal bone where it acts to extend the wrist and adduct the hand. This muscle originates in the middle on the posterior side of the ulna. The two muscles of the deep layer of the posterior compartment of the forearm include the extensor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. The extensor pollicis longus extends the metaphalangeal and interphalangeal joints of the thumb. It in originates on the posterior lateral side of the ulna and it inserts on the distal phalanx of the thumb. More laterally, we have the extensor pollicis brevis and this attaches to the proximal phalanx of the thumb and helps extend the metaphalangeal joint of the thumb. This originates on the posterior side of the radius and it inserts on the proximal phalanx of the thumb helping to extend the thumb. Now we will look into the muscles that move the hip joint or thigh. We start with, with the ellipsoas, and this is a collection of the psoas major and the iliacus that merge together and insert on the femur. The origin of the ellipsoas are the, ver, ver, ugh, the bod, bodies and transverse process of the lumbar vertebrae and they insert on the lesser trochanter of the femur. And so this helps to flex the thigh as well as flexion and lateral bending of the lumbar vertebral column. The iliacus is one of the muscles that helps to make up the ellipsoas. And this muscle is also involved with flexion of the thigh where it originates on the iliac crest in the ala of the sacrum, and it inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. The psoas major 
is also one of the muscles that helps to make up the ellipsoas. And this muscle is involved in flexion of the thigh and also flexion and lateral bending of the lumbar vertebral column. This muscle originates on the bodies and transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae and it also inserts on the lesser trochanter of the femur. With the muscles that move the thigh, we have now four different compartments. The anterior compartment muscles either extend the knee or flex the thigh. The muscles of the medial compartment act as the adductors of the thigh. The muscles in the lateral compartment abduct the thigh. And most muscles of the posterior compartment act as both flexors of the knee and extensors of the thigh. The sartorius is found on the anterior compartment of the thigh and it is a long strap-like muscle that projects obliquely across the anterior surface of the thigh from the superior lateral to the inferior medial side. It acts on both the hip and the knee joints by flexing and later laterally rotating the thigh while flexing and medially rotating the leg. This muscle is the longest in the body and is nicknamed the Taylor's muscle because it helps us sit cross-legged just as tailors used to back in the day. The adductor muscles are found within the medial compartment of the thigh, and they include the adductor brevis and adductor longus. The adductor brevis originates on the pubis, and it inserts on the linea aspira of the femur, which is on the posterior side, which this muscle is involved in the adduction flexion, and medial rotation of the femur. The adductor longus, again, on the medial compartment of the thigh, also originates on the pubis, and it inserts on the linea aspera of the femur. This muscle will be longer than the adductor brevis, and this, too, is involved in adduction and flexion, as well as medial rotation of the femur. The adductor magnus is going to be the largest fan-shaped muscle of the adductor muscles. And this muscle originates on the ischial tuberosity and it inserts on the linea aspera of the femur. The action of this muscle is to adduct, flex, and medially rotate the femur as well as extend the femur. The gracilis is going to be a very thin, long muscle that extends from the pubic symphysis where it originates to the medial surface of the tibia. And this action for this muscle includes adduction of the thigh, also flexion and medial rotation of the thigh, as well as flexion of the leg. The pectineus is going to be one the most superior most muscle of the adductor muscles. And it originates on the pubis and it inserts on the femur. It allows for lateral rotation of the thigh. The gluteus maximus is found on the posterior side of the body. And it is the largest of the, th of the gluteal muscles and one of the largest muscles of the body. It's the chief extensor of the thigh and it laterally rotates the thigh. It originates on the posterior surface of the sacrum and the coccyx, and it inserts on the gluteal tuberosity of the femur. And it is an antagonist of the ipsiloas muscle. The gluteus medius is going to be deep to the gluteus maximus and is a powerful abductor of the thigh. This muscle also medially rotates the thigh, and this is where intermuscular injections are often given to this muscle. The gluteus medius originates on the ilium, and it inserts on the greater trochanter of the femur. The tensor fascia latte is a muscle that is found on the lateral side of the body, and it is a muscle that is involved for stabilizing the hips especially during walking, and it is synergistic to the gluteus maximus. This originates on the iliac crest and the anterior superior iliac spine, 
and it inserts on multiple fibers of the iliotibial tract or the IT tract. And so the action is to help with abduction and medial rotation of the thigh. The hamstrings group are found on the posterior compartment of the thigh alongside with the gluteus maximus and gluteus medius. And the hamstrings are the prime movers of thigh extension and knee flexion and include the biceps femoris, semitendinosus, and the semimembranosus. The biceps femoris is a two-headed muscle that inserts on the lateral side of the leg. This muscle can also laterally rotate the leg when the leg is flexed. The long head of the biceps femoris originates on the ischial tuberosity, just like with the semimembranosus and the semitendinosus. The short head of the biceps femoris originates on the linea aspera of the femur, and the short head cannot move the thigh, but it does help with the other hamstring muscles in flexing the leg. The semitendinosus is superficial to the semimembranosus and is attached to the medial leg. The semimembrane tendinosus medially rotates the leg when the leg is flexed and it inserts on the medial surface of the tibia. The semimembranosus is deep to the semitendinosus, and it originates from the ischial tuberosity, and it attaches to the medial side of the leg. And it also helps with extension of the thigh and flexion of the leg. The quadriceps femoris, or commonly referred to just as the quadriceps, are found on the anterior compartment or the extensor compartment of the thigh, and they are involved as the movers for knee extension and are the most powerful muscles in the body. The quadriceps femoris is a single is a composite muscle with four heads. And the four heads include the rectus femoris, the vastus lateralis, the vastus medialis, and the vastus intermedius. The rectus femoris is on the anterior surface of the thigh, and it is superficial to the vastus intermedialis. This muscle originates on the anterior inferior iliac spine in the acetabulum, and it inserts on the patella and tibial tuberosity. It is involved in extension of the leg and flexion of the thigh. The vastus lateralis forms the anterior lateral surface of the thigh, which originates on the gluteal tuberosity and linea aspera of the femur, and it inserts on the patella and is involved in leg extension. The vastus medialis is on the medial side and on, in the anterior side of the thigh, and it originates on the linea aspera and inserts on the patella to extend the leg. And finally, of the quadriceps femoris muscles, we have the vastus intermedius, and it is positioned deep to the rectus femoris and is sandwiched between the other two vastus lateralis and vastus medialis muscles. This originates on the anterior and lateral surface of the femur, and it inserts on the patella also to help extend the leg. The anterior compartment of the leg muscles are involved in dorsiflexion of the foot and or extension of the toes. The posterior compartment of the leg is composed of muscles that are separated into superficial and deep groups that are involved in foot plantar flexion or flexion of the toe. The toe extensors that are found in the anterior compartment help to extend the toes and dorsiflex the foot, and the two major ones are the extensor digitorum longus and the extensor hallucis longus muscles. The extensor digitorum longus sends four long tendons to attach to the dorsal surface of toes two through five. This muscle dorsiflexes the foot and extends toes two through five, where it originates on the lateral condyle of the tibia and anterior surface of the fibula, and it inserts on the middle phalanx of toes two through six.
the extensor hallucis longus, sends a tendon to the dorsum of the hallux, and so it dorsiflexes the foot and extends the great toe. It originates on the middle anterior surface of the fibula, and it inserts on the distal phalanx of the hallux bone. The tibialis anterior muscle is also in the anterior compartment of the leg, and it is a primary dorsiflexor of the foot at the ankle. This muscle attaches to the middle plantar side of the foot, and it also helps to invert the foot. It originates on the lateral tibial condyle, and it inserts on the medial cuneiform and metatarsal number one. Within the posterior compartment, we have on the superficial layer, the gastrocnemius, that is the most superficial of the muscles of the posterior compartment of the leg. It has two thick muscle bellies, the lateral head and the medial head, that collectively form the prominence on the posterior part of the leg, often referred to as the calf. This muscle spans both the knee and the ankle joint, and it flexes the leg and plantar flexes the foot. It originates on the femur, and it inserts on the calcaneus bone. The soleus is a broad, flat muscle that is deep to the gastrocnemius. This muscle plantar flexes the foot, and this one is highly involved and is considered to be a postural muscle, and so it is mainly composed of slow twitch fibers, where it's about 96% slow twitch fibers. It originates on the head of the fibula, and it inserts on the calcaneus. The toe flexors that are found in the posterior compartment are also found within the deep layer of this compartment. And so these are involved for flexion of the toes and plantar flexion of the foot. And so the two that we will examine are the flexor digitorum longus and the flexor hallucis longus. The flexor digitorum longus attaches to the distal phalanges of toes 2 through 5, and it plantar flexes the foot and flexes the metaphalangeal and distal interphalangeal joints of toes 2 through 5. It originates on the middle and posterior surface of the tibia, and it inserts on the distal phalanges of toes 2 through 5. The flexor hallucis longus originates on the fibula, and its tendon travels medially and runs along the plantar side of the foot to attach to the distal phalanx of the great toe. This muscle plantar flexes the foot and flexes the great toe. The popliteal muscle is also on the deep layer of the posterior compartment of the leg, and it acts to flex the leg. This muscle also medially rotates the tibia slightly to unlock a fully extended knee joint. This muscle originates and inserts on the popliteal region, so it only moves the knee and not the foot.